This is Dmitry Golovin from the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care at Indiana University, and today we're going to talk about a really important topic of ICU sedation. This lecture is geared towards ICU providers at all levels. So why focus on sedation and analgesia in the ICU? Most disease processes that land patients in the ICU are associated with significant pain, such as pancreatitis, or anxiety, like in COPD exacerbation, usually a combination of both. Add to this invasive procedures such as intubation and mechanical ventilation, central lines, chest tubes, and even prolonged immobilization, and it's obvious why studies have shown that pain is the single most common memory that patients have of their ICU stay. Relieving pain and anxiety is important to allow treatment to take course and to prevent self-injury, the obvious example being self-extubations. At the same time, although literature and sedation indications is mixed, the available body of evidence has shown time and time again that over-sedation increases ICU complications, including prolonged ventilation and delirium. Additionally, Every individual anesthetic and analgesic has its own complement of possible adverse reactions. The risk of these also increases when higher doses are used. So, we owe it to our patients to know how to choose the right medication to relieve their pain and anxiety without overdoing it and creating iatrogenic complications. This is what the rest of this video is about. Obviously, increasing levels of sedation make it difficult to inquire about pain levels. But this is still so important because we know from years of surgical literature that patients can feel pain despite high levels of sedation. How do we know that pain is adequately controlled? One thing we can do is ask. And there are ICU patients who can certainly tell us about their pain. We can also look for cringing, restlessness, hypertension, and tachycardia. And though vital signs and agitation can have multiple causes in the ICU, cringing could be a very specific sign for patient discomfort. The most common way of assessing ICU sedation is the Richmond Agitation and Sedation Scale, or RAS. We've all heard of it, but let's review. RAS starts at zero. Zero is alert and calm. Think of this as the senior resident at 7 a.m. after she already had her first cup of coffee. From here, increasing levels of sedation cause the score to become more negative, while increasing levels of agitation make it more positive. Think of plus one as her intern arriving for his first ever morning in the intensive care unit. At minus one, a patient will, awake, will awaken to voice and maintain eye contact for at least 10 seconds. Distinguishing minus one from minus two is a patient who awakens to voice but maintains eye contact for less than 10 seconds. A minus three, a patient will awaken and move but will not make sustained eye contact. RAS score has been shown to have low inter-observer variability and is fast and easy to use. So where do we want our patients? Ideally between 0 and negative 2. Higher RAS scores should prompt an increase in sedation and perhaps assessment for delirium with a CAM ICU score. Scores lower than minus 2 should prompt a decrease in sedating medications. Occasionally, you may have patients who you'd want to keep at the lower end of the spectrum close to the minus two, maybe even the minus three range. The example I can think of is the patient with ARDS undergoing low tidal volume ventilation with permissive hypercapnia, which could be extremely distressing. So what's one important limitation of RAS scores? How do we assess sedation in a patient who is paralyzed? Clearly, they won't be opening their eyes or responding to command, though if they are under sedated, they surely will want to. Enter COVIDian with their bispectral index monitor. This is an EEG monitor that senses cerebral cortical activity through a series of electrodes placed on the forehead, puts it through a proprietary algorithm, and converts it to a number that is a surrogate measure for consciousness. Now let me say that again. These are a series of electrodes that sense cortical activity, process it, and convert it to a surrogate score for consciousness. Higher numbers imply greater consciousness, and lower numbers imply greater sedation. Using anesthesia literature supplied by the manufacturer, we can see that the ideal score for ICU patients would be between 40 and 60. Now, this score was originally validated in healthy surgical patients undergoing general anesthesia, and there are multiple caveats in its interpretation. 
Looking at the information supplied by the manufacturer, you can see that this is only a general association between the clinical state and this values. But the ranges assume that the EEG is free of R effects that can affect its performance. Titration of anesthetics to BIS ranges should be dependent on the individual goals established for each patient, and these goals may vary over time depending on the context of patient status and treatment plan. That's a mouthful of caveats. What does this mean for the ICU patient? At best, the information is extrapolated for use in the ICU. But there are multiple known modes of failure. Some of these are technical, misplaced electrodes, sweat, and thermal blankets. Others are pharmacologic. This monitoring measures a certain type of frontal cortical activity that is notoriously not affected through the use of ketamine sedation that causes a dissociative state that's not picked up on the BIS monitor. The number can be affected by anti-epileptic drugs and opioids, which together with hypnotic agents such as propofol, increase sedation without affecting the BIS core, which could result in over-sedation. Medical conditions such as seizures, cortical damage from ischemia or trauma, cerebral palsy, and others can all affect the results in the monitor. There are case reports of patients who are awake with low BIS scores and patients who are deeply sedated whose BIS scores are quite high. There is one study that showed that BIS scores below 60 had a sensitivity near 90% for predicting deep sedation, which sounds good, but also tells you that one out of 10 patients can have too much awareness while in the paralyzed state if relying on BIS monitoring alone. What's my usual practice? I like to see how BIS correlates with the RAS score before initiating paralysis. Be mindful of the caveats mentioned above, and keep a close eye on the patient's vital signs, which may suggest pain or anxiety. And that's it for goals of sedation. In the next part of this video, we're going to talk about sedating and analgesic medications.